Sophie's death has come as such a shock. It feels so cruel that one of the greatest artistic voices of our moment has been taken from us so early. A lot of people have said that they found Sophie's work to be a source of reassurance through periods of intense struggle or transformation. And I think for that reason, losing her now, as basically the whole world goes through one of those, feels all the more difficult. But I also think that the reassuring quality of Sophie's work is a great place to look right now. Sophie's ability to express harsh and overwhelming feelings and hopefulness at the same time was one of her greatest talents. And there's so much to celebrate about her life and work. Sophie's work challenged widely held assumptions about authenticity, technology, the future, and pop and experimental music. And she was able to create sounds that were both incredibly detailed and exciting and fun. And she could express deep feelings in a way that was widely relatable and easy to receive. For me, Sophie's work is truly a gift to humanity and a wonderful example of the heights that we can reach through creativity. Sophie was also an incredibly graceful and self-determined representative of the trans community, which has given her existence an even deeper meaning for so many people. So I hope that by taking some time to reflect on her story, her ideas, and her music, and just how important she was to so many people, that we might be able to find some reassurance too. Sophie was born in Glasgow in 1986, and even as a young kid, she was already very interested in electronic music. She would steal electronic music cassettes from her dad's car so that she could listen to them. And when she was 13, she started making music of her own. I got a keyboard for my birthday, and later a few more bits of equipment, and that's how I'd spend my whole time. I used to say to everyone, even at 13, 14 years old, when I get home from school, I'm just going to lock myself in my room until I've made an album. I would be on my own a lot of the time doing music. It was an escapism thing. I also had quite a lot of brothers and sisters growing up, who I'm close with, but they probably had best friends. I didn't really have a best friend. I had good friends, but music, I suppose, became my escape. Been there. In her late teens and early 20s, she played in a band, collaborated on some performance art projects, scored a short film, and DJed some weddings. Then she met A.G. Cook and Danny Harl, who started the PC music label and got involved with that community in London. In 2013 and 14, she released a series of singles including Bip and Lemonade, which quickly raised her profile. I remember hearing Lemonade for the first time when it first came out and my tiny little dome was like totally blown away. It was like the fizziest drink at the loudest, brightest rave. Anyway, Lemonade in particular pretty much took off and got covered by The Guardian and Resident Advisor and etc. But Sophie's music was pretty polarizing back then, though. A lot of people received it cynically, thinking that it was ironic or vapid. You're supposed to be proud of yourself for being in on the joke, on knowing the references. That's the wink wink. PC music is almost a double wink. I hate to say it's post-ironic, but that's what this is, right? It's incorporated the laugh track right into the beat. I'm honestly not surprised that people reacted this way, and I'm not trying to vilify anyone who did, but as time has shown, these were clearly bad takes. Sophie's work leans into the fact that we live in a hyper-commercialized and technologized world. It might be easy to take for granted the fact that we carry these little supercomputers around with us in our pockets every day that are all connected to each other and the largest repository of human knowledge. And while it might be a little bit less easy to take for granted the fact that we're constantly bombarded by hundreds of personalized advertisements every day, it's still generally accepted as a fact of modern life. In the summer before Lemonade was released, Sophie produced a track called Hey Cutie for an artist of the same name. And it was the only track ever released by that artist and was basically just an advertisement for an energy drink. The video features the singer Hayden Dunham, whose emotional state is measured in a laboratory and then distilled into the drink. Dunham herself didn't even sing on the recording, but she did post frequently on a Twitter account for Hey Cutie. What I love about this concept is how little it's actually exaggerating. Like, people wrote about this music as though it was this hyper-ironic over-exaggeration, but when the vast majority of our digital media is curated based on hundreds of data points that are being collected on us every day, how much of an exaggeration is it to sell a custom energy drink based on our specific interests, feelings, and desires? As the label boss for PC Music, A.G. Cook, said himself, considering the future is a blatant exercise at looking at the present. The future is happening right now if you just like Blink. Sophie's music does such an amazing job at showing the zipper on the costume of authenticity. It might seem like things are getting less and less authentic, 
Everything we consume online is hyper-curated, and artifice is truly the norm. And our growing self-awareness of that artifice just gets baked back into how we represent ourselves. But the thing is, humans always have mixed intentions when we communicate, and are always trying to represent ourselves in a certain way. And that doesn't mean that I think we're purely manipulative or malicious when we communicate. It's just how we are, or even how we have to be. There are always so many different ways of communicating a single idea, and our ability to communicate our ideas effectively is pretty essential to getting along in the world. Like say I had this friend that kept on showing up late to our hangouts. I could say something like, hey, I wonder if we could communicate a little better about what time we're supposed to meet up, because I've had to wait quite a while the last few times and it's starting to make me feel a bit disrespected. Or I could say nothing, and then like two hours into our hangout, out of the middle of nowhere, I could say something like, well, yeah, but clearly you don't respect my time, otherwise you wouldn't keep on showing up so late. Clearly the first one is going to be much better at getting me what I want, and maintaining a healthy relationship with my friend. And the reason why is because I would have been able to communicate my feelings and ideas effectively. I'm not trying to say that there's no such thing as communicating with malicious intent, because obviously there is. But my point is that the idea that we can separate artworks, or speech, or even people into authentic and inauthentic categories is at odds with reality. And all Sophie has to do is exaggerate her presentation of authenticity ever so slightly to show it as it really is. Basically just an aesthetic? Like, to borrow Sophie's example, is an all-vinyl DJ really more authentic? Or are they just adopting an aesthetic of authenticity? At this point, Sophie had not appeared in any of her visual media and engaged very little with interviews and public appearances. At one show she did in 2014, she stood off to the side and pretended to be a bouncer, while the drag queen Ben Woozy pretended to play the music. But people also reacted negatively to the fact that she obscured her identity saying that it was like a publicity stunt. There were a lot of terrible takes about appropriating femininity back then, which are obviously just extremely harmful and inaccurate. At around this time, Sophie released a full length called Product that included her previous singles and four new ones, including MSMSMSM and Just Like We Never Said Goodbye. She was also doing a bunch of collaborations around this time. She produced Charlie XCX's Vroom Vroom EP, and she even got a production credit on Madonna's Bitch, I'm Madonna. In 2017, she released a single called It's Okay to Cry, which for me represents a significant maturation in her work. With the product tracks, she showed that she could imagine and realize a compelling artistic concept, and that she could create incredible sounds. But with the music that followed, she also showed that she could use her emotional intelligence to communicate some deep feelings. The video for It's Okay to Cry was the first time that she appeared in any of her visual media and publicly made herself known as a trans person. And the video is incredible. I love how she deals with the like coming outness of it. Like here she is, never appeared on camera before, with no statement to the media, and her way of answering a question of how do I show the world I'm trans is to dance topless and sing directly into the camera. The lyrics can easily be read as a message to her past self. I can see the truth through all the lies, and even after all this time, just know you've got nothing to hide. The song slowly builds into a full power Sophie-esque climax, and she dances the happiest dance as rain pours down on her. But the song wouldn't be so powerful if it was just a coming out or a song about trans acceptance or whatever. Sophie showed her songwriting brilliance by being able to distill her own personal feelings and experiences into something more widely relatable. Even though a song might start out as a specific situation that you're recalling, the ones that stay with you actually take on a less specific and more general meaning, which is actually the theme, and you've just been able to access that theme through something personal. So ultimately, the song communicates itself pretty clearly. The themes are emotional repression and that kind of thing. The story isn't important and it can actually be limiting to further explain that situation. It's more that you're able to access the root issue and why you felt that feeling in the first place. Then in the summer of 2018, she released the full length called The Oil of Every Pearl's Uninsides, which basically solidified her position as a gay icon. Among other accolades, the album charted in the US and the UK and peaked at number two on the UK dance album chart. It received positive reviews from basically all the places, including The Guardian and The Rolling Stone and Pitchfork. Peter Boulos of Exclaim said, For all the praise that could be heaped on the bulk of Sophie's output, the best that comes to mind is that it sounds like no one else could have made oil of every pearl's uninsides. This is the kind of music that, 
in 20 years, we may look back on as a pivotal point in changing the trajectory of the pop music sound. The album was also nominated for a Grammy, making Sophie one of only three trans women to ever be nominated in any category. For me personally, the oil of every Pearl's Uninsides took my relationship with Sophie's work from being that of an incredibly talented and interesting artist to being that of work that I'll take with me for the rest of my life. I think one of the most amazing things that art can do is show you something about yourself or the moment that you live in. And the oil of every pearl's uninsides does exactly that. It's such a clear reflection of a period of intense transformation that I was going through personally in 2018 when it came out, and that I think our entire generation has been going through in an ongoing way since we've been old enough to recognize it. It's brutally honest, harsh, and overwhelming, which makes sense when the climate is changing and the economy is failing, for most people. I think this is also part of why Sophie is so important to so many trans people. It's not just a question of Sophie herself being trans. Her work is such an honest and self-determined reflection of so many of our experiences. But unlike how we're so often misrepresented in the media, Sophie's work creates space for real joy and self-celebration amidst the also very real confusion and suffering that so many of us experience. Sophie's message is one of very few that can be genuinely reassuring because it doesn't sugarcoat reality, but it also manages to show us how we can be beautiful. I think this works on a more general level too, like the world is a totally overwhelming and scary place right now, but there really is so much to be joyful about. The track that embodies this message better than any other is Immaterial. Its 90s rave synths, 2000s pop syncopation, and anthemic vocals make it pretty much the danciest song imaginable. But the lyrics in the verse go, day after day, life after life, with no name and no type of story. Where do I live? Tell me, where do I exist? In the following years, she went on to do a bunch of collaborations with Lady Gaga, Kim Petras, and Charlie XCX. She continued releasing music until her death, with her final release coming out just two days before she passed away. I found Sophie's death to be very upsetting. It's weird, I've never really been that sad about a celebrity or famous person dying before. I guess I've just never been able to see myself in someone like I could with Sophie. It's made me think about all these weird relationships that we form with people that we don't even know, but who are nevertheless very real and important to us. A part of me feels so angry and cheated that she was taken from us so early. She was such a graceful representative of the trans community, and she was one of the greatest musicians of our generation. It's sort of like, how could a person like that even really exist? And I guess that's kind of the thing. That person, my idea of Sophie, really did only exist in my mind. And for that reason, a lot of what Sophie has meant to me as a fan and a stranger is still very much here with me. And I doubt we're gonna have to worry about her being forgotten anytime soon. But it is still just so weird that she's just gone. But the thing is, the Sophie for me and the Sophie for pretty much everyone else watching this video is very much still alive. She left us with a hopeful vision of a whole new world. And while she won't personally be here with us to see it, I think her music can, at least in some small way, be here to guide us through. As I keep on saying, Sophie's work has had a great impact on so many people's lives. Sophie herself said that people tell me the work has had a genuine reassuring effect on their lives, and those are the people that I care about. So I thought it would be cool to hear from some of those people. Last week I got in touch with a bunch of my music friends and made a public call out for people to film themselves talking about what Sophie has meant to them. And this is what I got back. <sighs> Sophie. <laughs> she, she wasn't just visible in somebody else's space, she made new space, she made new freedom and then invited other people into that freedom and just created like more of the world to live in. It was Sophie who made me want to, you know, make all my drum sounds, all my effects, all my everything, pads from scratch. Sophie was truly a pioneer of two things, electronic music and creating literally whole new worlds where everyone was welcome from all sorts of backgrounds. Sophie's music was really important to me 
when I was first understanding and accepting my own trans identity. And to come across Sophie's music and come across this music that was distinctly pop, but also like very much experimental and harsh and weird and rough and powerful. To bring a lot of experimental sounds and techniques into pop music, even though, you know, it could get pretty, pretty weird sometimes. Like, why do we make a snare sound sound like a snare from a drum kit still? We could, we could make it sound like anything. We could make our drums be anything. They're like almost placeholders. They could be whatever we want. And I think this is that sort of spirit is really moving to me. And it meant a lot to see this trans woman come into her own and present herself and present this beautiful, like, um, wacky image alongside the music. And uh, that meant a lot to see. Being able to see a trans woman who is not just um, visible in the broader public eye as a musician, but was really excelling at it and receiving recognition for her work was and still is really empowering to me as a trans feminine electronic musician. And, and I think that's why her legacy really uh, has to be uplifted uh, moving forward, because not only is it representational of um, a lot of music that has been uh, ignored or erased or kept underground. Um, it, it's also uh, sonically uh, the future of uh, pop music. Something that I think all queer artists and the coming generations of queer kids need to know and remember. They told me that there are no excuses anymore. She walked the path so we can run it. I think the best way to honor her legacy was would be to do your own timbres, your own sounds. Yeah, rather than just sort of making a Sophie sound like thing, which I think no one really needs because she did it the best. Obviously, she was, you know, a trans and queer icon, so pretty amazing legacy and tragic circumstances. There's more space in the world and there's more freedom in the world having had her here. And that means so much to me. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for watching this episode of Sounds Good. Oh my god, it's windy as fuck out here. <laughs> Um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who submitted a video. Um, not everyone's video made it into the final version. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your feelings and experiences with me. It really means uh, so much to me. Um, if you really like the video and you want to support uh, Sounds Good and help it continue or maybe even grow, uh, you can do that through my Patreon. You can get access to all kinds of bonus stuff. Um, and I also have t-shirts now at my Big Cartel, uh, soundsgoodchannel.bigcartel.com, so check that out too if you're interested. See you guys soon! Oops! <laughs>